God doesn't like lazy people. God has created you and he wants to see the absolute best you can be. I think that if you don't take care of yourself, God has no interest in taking care of you. If you have a Ferrari on the drive and you don't take care of it, who's going to take care of it? Nobody. I think that taking care of yourself and being the best possible version of yourself you can be is how you please God. I think that's one of the best ways to mm -hmm. praise him mm -hmm. is to wake up every day and say, I need to be the strongest, smartest, fastest, most fearsome, most stoic, most capable man I can sure. possibly sure. be. This is how I please God. Yeah. When I say I don't believe in depression, nobody convinced me to can convince me to believe in depression. That's not a matter of discussing whether depression is real or not. That's a matter of me accepting that my mental model for going through life is more com is more effective if I don't believe I can become a depressed person. Yeah. I don't believe in depression, so I can't be depressed. So that allows me to be more effective. It's not a matter of sitting there going, well, maybe it's true, maybe it isn't. I don't believe in it, so, so I can't catch it. Why else would you adopt any kind of mindset unless it's designed specifically to make you competitive and make you win? You install the software in your mind, right? So we're all programmed to some degree. I agree with you on this so far. <laughs> I don't think anybody can escape programming, whether it's society, whether it's a television show, whether it's the people around you, peer pressure, whether it's a religion. We're all programmed to some degree. That's absolutely not really true. What I have done and what I think most people do not do is heavily analyze why I hold the beliefs I hold, why, I, why they help me, if I, don't, if I don't hold the belief personally, or if I didn't learn it from personal experience, I know where it came from, who tried to teach me that, whether their intentions for me were good or bad. And I've tried very hard to have my mindset rigidly analyzed and make sure that it's put together in a way which benefits me completely and absolutely. And I do not believe in things that take away power from me. I, ref I refuse to do that. I would rather say that they are not real. And people will sit here and argue to the end of time that they are real, but they're not real in my world and I live inside of my mind. So even if you throw me in a Romanian dungeon, the idea that I become a depressed person is not a framework that my mind works within, so I can't become depressed. I can feel a little bit sad, sure, I can feel depressed, but I can't be depressed. They're very different things. So that's just the mindset I've installed and it's allowed me to be competitive. And I believe, personally, my personal beliefs are that life as a man is hyper competitive and whatever software you have in your mind should be designed to make you as competitive as possible and you shouldn't be believing in absolutely anything else. So I've, I've tried very hard to make sure all of my worldviews and all of my experiences and everything is created and aimed in a, a direction which is gonna allow me to be a fierce competitor in all realms of human endeavor. I will never adopt the thinking of somebody who is sad and I will never adopt the thinking of somebody who is less competitive than I am or less successful than I am. If someone comes along and goes, Andrew, you are wrong, the way you see the world is wrong, but they are suffering from an affliction, why would I adopt a single iota of what they say? So it, it's kind of funny when I talk about depression, the number of people who defend depression. Mm -hmm. Depression's ruined my life, it's super real, and I lost my wife and my life is over and I want to kill myself, it's real. I'm like, surely you should like my, my worldview. If depression's so terrible and it's destroyed your entire existence, right. you should be listening to me tell you it's not real. Right. But instead they're defending it and sticking up for it, which I find very interesting. So that's the first thing. In regards to whether I have had any of my convictions challenged, it's kind of amazing. Maybe it's just a semantics trick. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe it's as simple as saying, I feel a little bit depressed today, but I am not a depressed person right. and I cannot become depressive. I'm not going to have depression. Maybe it's just a semantics trick. And by saying that alone, I understand that it's a temporary state of mind, which I can alter and I can affect. And I've never struggled with long-term depression or long-term negative thoughts because I don't believe in that mental model. I think that your mind, like I said, it's software, it's programmed in, and they say inside the matrix or in every single video game, there are boundaries and there are limits or certain things you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe I, my mind can be put in a state of permanent negativity. I don't believe in that. I don't think it's possible. So it just doesn't happen. It's the uncertainty that I struggle with the most because in my life, I'm in charge of everything. I know exactly how everything works and I'm the boss and I get to control absolutely everything. And this is the first time in a long time I'm in a scenario where I have no power whatsoever, yeah. no influence basically. Uh -huh. I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody else knows what's going to happen. And also in my world view, in my world, I'm the hero, right? I'm the head of the clan, not just my family, right. but of a lot of people. A lot of people rely on me. Lots of women rely on me. Children rely on me, etc. So everyone comes to me every time there's a problem. So they continue to do that while I'm in a jail cell, expecting me to have some kind of answer. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't have an answer this time. Every other time I had an answer, but this time is a bit unique. It's very frustrating and it's the uncertainty that would bother me. I don't think I felt sad very often, but I certainly felt extremely frustrated. Mm. I would sit there and think, 
there has to be a way out of this room. Not break out, but like there must just be some words I can say, someone I can talk to. There must be a way. It's only a door. Like there, I can't just be stuck in this room. And it, it, was, it was hyper frustrating. Yeah, and it, the uncertainty of it is also scary because in my situation, every 30 days they decide if they hold you longer or not. And I was encountering people who had been there for years right. in my scenarios. It is torture. It's a, it, and it's designed to make you break. You don't know how long you're going to be there for. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. You hear horror stories. You see other people getting out who've done worse things than you after a week mm -hmm. because they've signed a piece of paper or admitted to something or whatever they've done, done a deal. And you're sitting there and yeah, it's hyper frustrating. And I, I think you have two choices as a man often when bad things happen. I feel like you can maybe get depressed and sad about it, but the other outlet's usually anger or a form of anger. I felt like anger was more, in many cases, anger is more effective, I guess, is more useful. You were angry in there? I wouldn't say I was angry, but if I started to feel negative, I could turn it into frustration or anger, which I could at least alleviate with 2,000 push-ups. Right. It's, it's better than feeling sorry for myself. I feel like if I had to choose one of the two outlets, deciding to use controlled anger was more beneficial than sitting around feeling sorry for myself. I don't ever believe in moping or feeling sad. So when I was at my worst, perhaps I was a little bit angry. But then again, I also think I do that in my normal life, if I'm honest. I don't think anger is a necessarily bad thing. I think that misdirected anger is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think if you get very angry about scenarios and you put it in the correct direction, you get unlimited motivation and you get a lot done. The water behind the dam, it can be destructive, but if it's pushing through the turbine, it powers the town, right? So if I wake up and I go, I want more money, if I can get pissed off enough about it, I can do 36 hour work days, right? So there's nothing wrong with being angry in my world as long as you are putting it in the correct direction. It's uncontrolled anger, I think, is a problem. I'm being as honest as possible. It's strange because I had this instilled sense of duty where even though I'm in a jail cell and I can't leave, and even though I'm cripplingly bored, I don't feel like I had time to feel pain. All, all the things I had to do still had to be done. Just because they threw me in a cell, it just made it more difficult, which means I have less time than ever because the difficulty has been increased. And when I would get on the phone, we wouldn't discuss how I'm feeling. I'd be worried about how everyone else is. They'd be like, how are you? Yeah, I'm in jail. What's going on with this? Are you okay? Are your bills paid? Are press hassling you? I was worried about fixing everyone else's problems from jail more than I was concerned about myself or my own mental well-being. And when I, if I felt particularly, when I say pain, pain is an, is an awkward one. I don't know if I felt pain because I don't feel sorry for myself and I've developed this mindset of such absolute accountability that even though what happened to me, I believe was unfair and even though I'm completely innocent, I didn't think, ah, why? I didn't, I didn't think, why is this happening? I didn't think, why me? I didn't think, oh, this is unfair. Like none of these things crossed my mind. I was like, this is garbage. However, you can't become the most Google man in the world right. without, uh, with every light has a dark, right? <laughs> like, let's be realistic about this. Yeah. Uh, I'm thrown in a jail cell. Do I belong here? No, but am I here? Yes. I was pretty logical about it. And I was like, okay, I've got a lot of things I need to get done. And I would feel angry if I couldn't get them done. But I don't think I felt pain. Now, I'll admit, I don't sleep very well since I've left. If, if someone were to say to me, Andrew, take this pill and your unresolved fear will vanish, I would say absolutely and utterly not. That's not fun. The fun is there's something in my mind which I don't have complete control or complete understanding of yet, and it's not detrimenting my day-to-day -day life really. Okay, I lose a bit of sleep, but this sounds like an interesting journey. It sounds like I'm in a new level of the video game and I've been thrust into a dark forest and I get to do something brand new. And I'm, I'm, I'm really genuinely not worried about it. And I think with your mind, you can do a lot of it yourself. And I think if you have a very strict framework and how you measure how successful you are as a human, and I do it through competence and achievement, I say, which mindset do I need to achieve as much as I can possibly achieve? Right. And I can measure that in real time. I can measure that in literally dollars and world championship title belts. I can literally measure the success. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, well then this is the mindset I need to have to be as successful as possible. Anything that's deviating me away from that needs to be addressed and, and concerned and, and dealt with. And I can do that myself. And I think the fear that, if, I, if it's fear that's waking me up from nightmares now, it's just because I understand there's a very big apparatus, a very big enemy, which I cannot destroy and I cannot be coming to get me. Mm -hmm. So I do think that wakes me up. I think the fear is healthy. I think I'd be stupid to not be afraid. But I don't necessarily want the fear to go away because I have no problems feeling bad. So I'm very happy with the mindset I have. And then we go into the argument, which is a level deeper, is 
do, am I supposed to be happy? Am I supposed to feel good? No, it's not happy. No, of course, but this is what I don't understand about people, especially men in the world today. Why are they say, so worried about being afraid? Why are they so worried about, I was afraid every time I fought. Yeah. I fought anyway. Yeah. Like, I don't let fear guide what I'm gonna do. I do what I'm supposed to do regardless of how I feel. So I don't see anything wrong with feeling fearful. I don't see anything wrong with feeling stressed or under pressure or anxious. All these things men are trying to get rid of. And I talk about men specifically, I gender this because I'm a man. I don't know how it feels to be a woman. But all these things that people are trying very hard to get rid of from their brains, I don't see why they need to leave. I will argue the point that if I feel anxious and pressured and stressed and fearful, I will get more done than if I was happy. I think if I was happy, I'd just be hedonistic and just wasting my time. I think that you get a whole bunch done with these negative connotations and negative emotions. And I think that life is suffering and pain and you're here to go through it. And, you're, and the sooner you get used to the taste, the more successful you're gonna be. I have no interest in trying to change the flavor, my friend. The flavor of life is pain <laughs> and I will eat all of it. And it doesn't matter if they put me back in jail or not. I, I'm not sitting there going, how can I be happy in jail? I will sit in jail and say, yes, this sucks. It's supposed to suck. Yes, I'm not enjoying this. Yes, I'm anxious and paranoid. And yes, that guy might stab me. And yes, I can't sleep and I miss my family. And this is what's supposed to happen to me. And this is how I become the best man I can possibly be. And I'm gonna succeed regardless. And I'm not even gonna sit here and say that I'm not delusional to a degree. I'm not saying that self-delusion well, doesn't we exist. Are. We all are, right? Let me give you a very simple example. Let me try and use an analogy. I think the only thing better than having everything you want is not wanting anything, right? So I have every car on this planet. I have 40 supercars. Most people want a supercar, I have 40. But there's that unique 0.1% of people who genuinely don't want one. And I think that's more freeing than having everything you want. Right? So the, the, the true mindset is not wanting anything. Most people, the best they can do is having everything they want. And I feel like you can kind of do this with the emotions as well. I guess my general consensus is that I don't think I can change or affect the world to the point where pain and suffering and bad things are not going to happen. So isn't it best if I just enjoy all of that? Doesn't that make me as powerful as possible if I say, oh yeah, okay, this is gonna suck, good. I mean, I do it when I fight. Uh -huh. Yesterday I was fighting, right? We were right. doing 12 rounds and all of us were destroyed. And the more he hurt me, the more I wanted to hurt him back. The more he hurt me, the better it felt. The more powerful I felt, the more he hit me. Because then it's my turn, right? So if I can't stop him from punching me and I'll do my best, but if I can't, then surely you should learn to enjoy it, right? And I don't think you can stop life from hitting you. And I don't think you can stop life from giving you unexpected surprises. And I don't think you can stop yourself from feeling sometimes sad or anxious or upset. So I think the best mindset you could adopt is finding that engaging and exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie to you. Although I am facing very serious charges and although they are trying to destroy my life and although I cannot sleep the same and although they're out to get me and although I've suffered, part of me is excited. Part of me is like, okay, if a man were to sit in front of you and say, I can rip your head off with my little finger, and he said it in the right terms, and he truly believed it in his heart, you wouldn't want him to try. As, as ridiculous as that sounds, you'd be like, it's kind of big, maybe. You know, it crosses your mind. So I think that, yeah, I have psychoanalyzed myself, even though I'm not officially, you know, certified. And I've decided that I can't stop bad things from happening to me. So instead, I'm gonna enjoy bad things happening to me. And I'm gonna build a mindset that makes me fearsome enough to succeed regardless of how stacked the odds are against me. Yeah. And, and I wanna make this very clear, I'm not a coward. I don't care if I don't sleep again for the rest of my life. I refuse to take any fucking pill and I refuse to sit and have my mind altered by anything I do not control. I don't care if I have nightmares for the rest of human time. Right. As long as I'm in charge of my mind, I'm in charge of my life, if God decides that I don't need nightmares anymore, I'll fathom out how to stop it. If God decides I need to wake up in the middle of the night in a sweat, fearful or afraid they're coming to get me, then that's God's plan for me and that's what I'm gonna deal with. I'm not a coward, I'm not afraid of any of these things. I'm not afraid of feeling bad. I'm not afraid of anxiety, I'm not afraid of panic. This is one of the things I think a lot of men out there struggle with is they're so worried and afraid of bad feelings. And, and to me, that's just showing that you've had an easy life. Like there's real people out here who are trying to kill you. There's people out here who put a knife in your neck. You're scared of what, feeling sad? Who cares? Like there's real problems. What are you worried about feeling sad for? Who gives a shit? I could feel sad for the rest of my life and I guarantee one, nobody would know. And two, I would be monumentally successful regardless. So, who, so why are we even talking about it? I have no fear for a negative feeling. I have fear for me not being able to provide for my children. I have fear for people who rely on me not being provided for and cared for. 
but I don't have a single, I don't wake up and go, oh, I really am worried if I might feel sad today. Who cares? Who cares? I can be happy or sad on the same day. Nobody notices and the same things get done. Exact same amount of work gets done. Nothing changes. Because there are some people who cannot be saved and it's not my intention to save everybody. I have no intention of trying to convince everybody to like me. My intention is to try to speak to the people out there who know what I'm saying is the truth and who like the way it's being presented and said. I, once again, have no concern with being disliked by X percentage of the population. And I want to make this clear. I've spoken to a lot of people who have talked about how their mental health has been affected by, you know, online bullying and media campaigns and smear campaigns. I don't think anybody's been attacked by the media in the last two years harder than me. Mm -hmm. Every day, mm -hmm. there is something in the media trying to paint me as a bad person. On, on TV channels from Ulaanbaatar to Utah, across the entire world, and I can sit here and stay categorically, I've never read a media report and been like, shit, I've just been like clowns. Don't care. Anybody who sits and watches the news and believes what the news says about me is the same kind of person who believes everything the news says. Right. And if you have two choices in this world, people are talking about the battle I'm in, and yes, I may be spearheading it, I may be at the front of it, but I believe that this war cannot be avoided. You are either at war against the injustice and against the lies, or you're at war with your own mind when you believe they're garbage. It is impossible for a man to believe the crap they want you to believe and be a happy functioning adult. It's impossible. If you believe the shit that's on the television as a man, you're gonna be miserable. So you're either at war with your brain or you're at war with them. Anyone who's gonna sit there and go, I believe Andrew Tate is a human trafficker. I have 25 vaccines. I believe in Ukraine. Uh, these people are already paying the price because they're already miserable. And I can guarantee everyone who dislikes me is an unhappy person because their minds are enslaved. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like, I don't feel, when someone sits to me, when someone sits across from me, which has never happened in person, but let's say someone on the internet right, makes a video about me, right? Mm -hmm. And these happen. A new, Andrew Tate's the worst man ever. I can load up the video and just look at him a fraction of a second and go he's paid right. the he's paid the price right, right. he's he's already he's already miserable if i was that person then depression would be real these are these are fat internet trolls losers who have no who can't compare to me in any human metric they know it which is why they dislike me because anybody who genuinely gets out in the world and looks for truth and looks to be successful and is tenacious and is brave agrees with everything i say so I don't feel pain when someone sits and says garbage about me because I believe that their mind is already suffering because they're not free. Their mind's not free. Anybody who can listen to what I say long enough and not be emotional about it and actually understand it, well, those people aren't paying a price. So maybe that's a coping mechanism, but every single time I see a woman who hates me or a man who hates me and I compare them to the people who like me, there's a massive contrast in overall physical attractiveness, success, financial success like it's amazing sure, sure. so it's like okay well my haters are way down here and right. the people who agree with me are way up here so let them hate by the end of the day there are people moving parts in all of this there's a prosecutor there's a, a judge there's a lawyer whatever someone is sitting in an office who gets a piece of paper saying destroy Andrew Tate and that person looks at my life and compares it to theirs and they feel resentful mm -hmm. and then they go okay let me use every power I have to try and destroy this man right if my life wasn't so asked Aspirational is a word you can use, but it also didn't tick nearly every single box in regards to every teenage boy's dream. I think that they would be a lot less interested in trying to hurt me. They're trying to hurt me because of the things I have and what I can do. I don't think humans are as emotionally incontinent as they pretend to be. And I believe that when you truly feel pain or truly feel trauma or something really bad happens to you, the result of that is usually silence. I don't think you talk very much at all. So people, you ask me, what is it like to be vulnerable? Well, to me, that's not crying, that's not... I think when anyone's doing that, 99% of the time it's a manipulation, I, mean, I believe, personally. Maybe that's just my personal experience. But yeah, maybe, but I think especially with men, especially with men, I think it's a, man a manipulation tactic when they try and show too much emotion, and women do it as well. And I don't react very well to it. If someone were to sit in front of me and start bawling their eyes out, it's very hard to elicit sympathy from me for that reason. I feel like you get sympathy from me by sitting and explaining to me why something bad happened to you in a logical, calm, stoic matter, manner. If someone starts crying in front of me, I feel like they're trying to manipulate me and I don't buy it. I think I've rooted out any weakness or I've compensated so heavily so long ago. I don't see myself as a weak person. I don't see myself as a person who can fail. People said to me in jail, how did you handle that? What else can I do? Not handle it? What does that look like? We're gonna bang my head on the wall like a dummy? Am I, gonna, am I gonna have a breakdown and just be, a, be a, a pile of mush? All you can do is handle it. So I've, I, 
you were talking about vulnerability. I'm being as vulnerable as I can, but I can't even, I can't even honestly sit here and tell you a weakness I have because in my mind, I have no weaknesses. And perhaps that's delusion. Perhaps that's, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it's delusion. Yeah, but that's, but a useful delusion is what you're saying. It's, it's brutally useful. Yeah. And when I teach this, or when I talk about this, there's a lot of men who perhaps want to adopt it, but the mistake they make is they don't have the real world experience to back it up. I don't want people to be completely lose their minds. Yeah. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about the fact that I can name so many scenarios in my life where I was supposed to fail and I did not fail. I'm, it's brutally realistic, it's brutally logical, it's built on competence, it's built on real world accolade and achievement. Everything I've ever wanted, I have achieved and I have gotten. I have never failed at anything I've ever wanted, ever. So how am I gonna wake up and say, oh, I've got this weakness, that weakness, when I have a 100% success rate? Mm -hmm. 100%. There's never a girl I wanted I didn't get. There's never a car I wanted I didn't drive. There's never a scenario where I said, I wanna get through this, I didn't get through it. Every single thing I do are the things I am absolute best at. Mm -hmm. If I, I'll, I'll put boxing gloves on after this and I'll go fight and I'll beat everybody, I'll destroy everyone. And I think I only enjoy things that I'm good at. And I also think that if I have X amount of hours in the day, the way I can be the most competitive, most fierce and predator is to spend all of my waking time doing things I'm the best at and leave things that I'm not good at to the other people who perhaps are good at them. Oh, I'm a lot more sensitive than people know. And this is one of the things I like to say when I talk about depression not being real or how life is pain and suffering, that doesn't mean that I, I'm not saying those things because I've never felt them. Yeah. I'm saying those things because I know them intimately. Mm -hmm. I'm saying those things because I know exactly how it would feel to label myself a depressed person. Yeah. I know it very well. I just refused to do it. Right. So yeah, I'm absolutely not really a sensitive person. I would label myself sensitive, but just maybe my, but, but maybe one second, I just want to go back to my original point. Yeah. Maybe my worldview is affected by, and we're talking about arrogance. When you wake up and all you do are things your world level at. Yeah. Everything you do are things you're fantastic at, right? Mm -hmm. All of the time. Yeah. And you beat everybody all of the time at all of it. Aren't you going to have a degree, a tinge, perhaps, of arrogance? Of course. Of course you are. So, but would I label myself an arrogant person? Well, I'm not going to sit down and say I'm good at something I'm not. Right. So I don't think I'm unrealistic. I think I take care of absolutely everybody I love in every single way. I think anybody who's ever needed me, I've been there for them if they've deserved it. I think anybody who listens to my message is becoming a better person overall. I genuinely believe I'm fixing and helping society. I don't know what else more I'm supposed to do. I mean, to a degree, I've almost martyred myself. Mm -hmm. What else more can I do? My options at this point are either to continue to help people and explain to men why I became so successful, which is all I'm basically doing. I'm saying you're a man and you're upset and you want to be X. I'm telling you how I became what I wanted to be. This is what I do. I think God wants me to be the best possible version of myself. I think that God dislikes people who are lazy. I said this to somebody yeah. once and he got very offended. I said, God doesn't like lazy people. God has created you and he wants to see the absolute best you can be. I think that if you don't take care of yourself, God has no interest in taking care of you. If you have a Ferrari on the drive and you don't take care of it, who's going to take care of it? Nobody. I think that taking care of yourself and being the best possible version of yourself you can be is how you please God. I think that's one of the best ways to mm -hmm. praise him mm -hmm. is to wake up every day and say, I need to be the strongest, smartest, fastest, most fearsome, most stoic, most capable man I can possibly be. This is how I please God. Yeah. Yeah. So I think your duty to God is also these things. And that's another massive source of strength that I, that I get. When I'm alone in a jail cell, I understand that God is still watching and God would be unhappy if I couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, maybe we can, we can talk about God or we can also talk about just about basic cosmic balance. I don't believe you can become the most famous man on the planet calling yourself the top G without the universe testing you if you're really about it. I don't think it's, you're gonna get to a point where the, where the universe, whatever you wanna call it, is gonna say, is he really the top G? Yeah. And you're gonna to have to prove it. If you walk through life and say, I'm, I'm, I'm made of iron, I'm Mr. Tough Guy, sooner or later, someone's gonna check you right. and find out if you are or not. Right. So when I was doing this for a very long time, I wasn't ignorant to the fact that something's gonna come along and see if I am who I am. So when I'm sitting in a jail cell by myself with cockroaches all over the floor, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, this is my chance to show I'm not full of shit. Right. Was I full of shit? No, I wasn't. Am I gonna allow everything I've ever said and my last name and my duty to God and everything to go down the pan or am I gonna just man up and fucking win? Right. So I saw it, I guess, to a degree as an opportunity, but there was a massive burden of responsibility on me on how I had to perform. I didn't have time to be depressed or sad. This is what I'm saying to you earlier. I didn't have time. 
I had, I had things to do. Top G's kids can't eat. Top G's women can't pay the bills. Top G's business is over. Top G, no, I had to fix all of it from jail and fix myself and get out. I was very busy <laughs> inside of my brain, <laughs> staring at a wall. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have time yeah, for this. Yeah, and, and this is another thing I try and explain to people and I don't understand about, and I talk about men specifically because I understand how to be successful as a man. When men say to me they're depressed, with unlimited options, with the capability to become anything you desire, with God giving you a full and able body and mind, how do you have time to be depressed? You have so much you could do. There's so much that you need to do to be your best self. And you're competing against men like me. Yeah. And you're finding hours a day to be sad. Mm -hmm. No wonder you're going to perpetually lose forever. Right. That's suicide. So how do you find time to do this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's brutally ineffective. You have a brain, you have a mind, you have a mental model. You can't think of everything. You can't do everything. You can only have certain frameworks instilled inside of your mind. As a man, you should be hyper competitive. You should try and be the best version of yourself you can be. You're competing against every other man on earth for the girl you want, the car you want, the house you want, the watch you wear. It's all competition. You should be as competitive as you possibly can. Anything that's inside of your mind which doesn't allow you to be competitive should be erased. This is why I can't name a weakness. I, I can't name a weakness I have. I've compensated so heavily for any weakness that may exist, I don't even see them anymore. I think that believing in God certainly makes you more powerful, which is proof for God. If God makes you more powerful, then God is real. So maybe that's very simplistic, but if I believe in God and I'm a more powerful version of myself because I believe in Him, then He must exist. God has made me more powerful. Well, it's the act of believing Him that makes Him exist. It's another way of saying it. No way saying. Correct, yeah. So this is why I believe faith is such an important thing. But I think everybody has a God. Yes. There's no such thing as atheists. If you look at the people who say, oh, I don't believe in God, they worship a, a flag mm -hmm. and a vaccine. Yes. So everyone believes in something. Yeah. So you have to decide what your religion is. And I, once again, refuse to believe in anything that takes away power from me. Mm -hmm. I believe in things that make me more powerful. And I believe that believing in God gives you a, a new degree of strength. And I also think everybody to some degree believes in God. I don't care what anybody says. If you put anyone in that submarine just before it imploded, everyone would pray. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. So it's ignorant to even say you don't believe in God at this point. There's, there's right and wrong in life. Mm -hmm. All this complete subjectiveness, this mush uh -huh. they're trying to create yeah. is done on purpose to confuse us. Yeah. I like the idea of right and wrong. I, I like the idea of not having a choice. If you walk in, if you're hungry and you walk in to buy a sandwich and there's a hundred sandwiches, it takes 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. If there's one sandwich, isn't life easier mm -hmm. sometimes? Yeah. So all this subjectiveness and all this choice and all this garbage, sometimes when I'm like, okay, I want to be a good person. I want a framework to adhere to that makes me a good person. Well, this is very clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, easy. There's been times I was in jail and I just got up and I just felt like, you know what? Yeah, like just shadow boxed a bit. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah. like you just felt it. Like I'm, I'm, I'll be okay. I will yeah. win. Yeah. I, I don't feel God when I'm sad or something like that. I think that the whole idea of spirituality, and I believe God himself, he wants the best for you. And it's interesting, yeah, how we're tying religion to, to my worldviews, because my worldviews were the same before religion. I guess before it was the cosmos, or just the way the universe works, or light, dark, yin, yang, etc. I still say these things, but now I attribute a lot more of it to spirituality, a lot more of it to God. And yeah, I chose Islam because it's firm, and I believe that I'm a person with firm principles. So I'm obviously gonna, I liken myself or I'm going to feel an affinity to a religion that has firm principles yeah. because that's who I am as a person. I'm a person who's principled, yes, no, and I have no problem with people sitting with me and saying what you're saying is bigoted or what you're saying is wrong or what you're saying is insensitive. Mm -hmm. I think Islam also has a similar issue. Yeah, I think you also chose the winning team. Oh, it's completely the winning team. <laughs> I mean, it's the winning team yeah. because, and it's the winning team. And I didn't choose it because it's the winning team. It's just, the, it's just the winning team because it has principles. Yeah, I agree. And unfortunately, when you have no principles, if you stick up, if you don't believe in it, if you have no hard line, if you'll accept anything, then you don't believe in anything. Yeah. As soon as you'll accept anything, then you have no hardcore beliefs. You have, if you have any set of principles or you have any things you believe in, there's gonna end up being a barrier and the people who fall outside of those barriers are gonna be offended by it. That's the reality of it. If you have a religion or a belief system that doesn't offend anybody, then it's not a religious or belief system, that's, that's my view. So yeah, I chose the winning team because I think more and more people are starting to understand how important God is in society. We're, this is the first time in human history we're testing society without God. And what do we have? We have evil, yeah. we have Satanism, we have degeneracy, 
And I think that most people are starting to understand that God is really needed. When I was young, I used to make fun of Bible bashers. Just make fun of them. And now I'm like, we need more. Where are they? <laughs> we need more Bible bashers. So, uh, yeah, and I, I guess I certainly feel more powerful since I've reverted, but I always felt powerful anyway. But I guess now, instead of just believing it's the cosmic nature of the universe or... Let me change that. I always felt a strong affinity to my last name and my ancestors. So I always had, a, to a degree, a spiritual aspect to where I got my strength. I always felt like, well, my dad is watching me. Or my ancestors tried very hard for me to be born, so I can't disappoint them. So I've always had this spiritualistic side. Like, I can't... My, imagine the disappointment my ancestors would feel if they fought saber-toothed tigers and survived World War II and went through all the garbage they went through just for my father to be born and he suffered like he suffered to raise me. For me to be raised and become the most famous man in the world and call myself Top G and then cry when I went to jail. Mm -hmm. What am I? What, I mean, what kind of bitch? What am I going to go, oh, wah? No. I go to jail with my head held high and if they put me in jail for the next 20 years, I'll walk in there with my head held high. And if anybody sees me, I'm not going to be a broken man. I refuse to be a broken man. It's disrespectful to everybody who ever died or tried hard for me to be raised, for me to emerge from this difficulty as a broken person. That's absolutely not really selfish. When a man sits and says to me he's broken or he's depressed or he's sad, etc., that's selfishness. You have shit to do. Yeah. And you have people to be respectful to, including people who are no longer here. I don't have time. They can put me in solitary confinement for 20 years, and when I walk out of there, and the first podcast I do, I refuse to be called broken. I refuse. And that's because I feel like I had a duty to my ancestors. And now I feel like I have a duty to my ancestors and a duty to God. Mm -hmm. So I've always felt that. And there's something that people say, you tried your best. And that's true. But a lot of people overuse it. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, well, you didn't get it, but you tried your best. 99% of the time they didn't try their best. Mm -hmm. People don't actually try very hard for things anymore. I am truly, genuinely trying my best. I don't waste a minute of my day. Mm -hmm. Before this podcast, as I set up cameras, I'm working. I don't waste a minute of my day. I do not miss a training session. I do not miss an email. I do not make mistakes. I no longer, like, I'm on it. So I'm trying my absolute best. If I fail for the first time in human history, then I fail. But at least I get the satisfaction in my heart of knowing I actually really tried my best. Most people don't get to get that satisfaction because they know deep down they could have tried a bit harder. Whereas if I end up in jail, I'll be like, Andrew, you did everything you could have done. So you, that gives you a level of peace. I did my best. My ancestors are proud of me. God is proud of me. I did my absolute best. I couldn't have possibly done better. And I got hit with a, a lucky punch and that's life. And all I can do is just smile regardless. So we'll talk about how I'm actually quite a sensitive person. Yeah. I think the reason people believe what I say is because they can feel that I feel when I talk. Yes. And it's because I feel things. Yes. So I'm not a cold person at all. I'm just a person with a lot of emotion that I try and control and channel in the correct directions. But I think that Yes, it's a superpower to a degree. Well, I think that's why people are, one of the reasons that people are so drawn to you, because you let whatever wants to come through, come through. And it's also why so many people hate me. Yeah, of course. Because there's no light without dark. Yeah. There's no, you know, there's no joy without pain. You can't have a rainbow without a little rain. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's definitely a superpower for life. It's something I'd encourage every man to learn how to do. Yeah. It's certainly something worth practicing. It's the reason I don't learn another language because I haven't mastered English yet. Right. So I refuse to learn another language. I, I can't imagine me and my personality and Andrew Tate stuttering in Spanish. It'd just be like, what is this garbage? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have time. Yeah. So yeah. I will only speak English for the rest of my human years. That's it, because I've not learned every word in the dictionary yet. But yeah, I guess to a degree it's a superpower. It's extremely beneficial mm -hmm. in all aspects of life, especially relationships. I'm not gonna lie. It's very, I don't argue with women very often because any woman who respects me and listens to me, I can very quickly and compendiously explain exactly why I'm correct. It's maybe the most powerful skill. It, the most powerful thing about it is there's, there's two levels to it. One, making people understand exactly what you think. Yes. And the second one is making them think what you think. I think that charity, even of itself, I think charity is probably one of the most selfish things you can do, which most people say, I'm giving money. I, I give $25 million a year website takepledge.com you can see it and I feed children all across the war-torn countries mainly in the Islamic world and in Africa am I doing that for the children yes but I also feel great I feel good 
for doing it. Of course. Yeah. So this, yeah. this, it's not a selfless act. No, nothing selfless. Nothing it selfless. And it shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be. That's right. So when I'm helping all these people out here, I'm not doing it because I'm some philanthropist. I feel good helping people and people sending me emails saying, you changed my life. I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm just Mr. Philanthropist and yeah. I just care about the world. Yeah. No, I like helping people because I feel good about doing it. It makes me feel good inside, yeah. Yeah. which is why I do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I use my power to feel good. And I think the best, the easiest way to feel good is to make others feel good. I believe that humans exist that way. And I think that's why we're societal animals. Mm -hmm. Even in jail, when I felt my worst, my goal was to make someone else smile. Because if I can make someone else smile, I would smile. <laughs> so it, it, on my worst days, I was uh -huh. my most charming, uh -huh. my most energetic, uh -huh. my most interesting, my most talkative. Yeah. I was happiest on my worst day uh -huh. because I decided that's how I have to be to stop myself feeling bad because I decided. I also feel like, you know, it's kind of interesting. No one's emotionless and I certainly feel things and I'm going to come up with a theory which you're going to call complete garbage because I am not qualified, but this is my theory. Yeah, go for it. I believe that emotional energy is a lot like a bucket of water. Mm -hmm. You have all this emotional energy, right? You have a bucket of water and then you have a bunch of different holes. You can pour it down. So I believe if you wake up one day and you feel particularly depressed, you don't feel depressed. You just have a lot of emotional energy that day. Some days you don't have that much emotional energy and life's pretty calm, but some days you wake up and you have this big bucket of water and the superpower is deciding which emotion you're going to put it in, not to not feel the energy, but to decide which emotion you're going to put it in. And I think that's my superpower. I don't have the superpower of being able to stop myself feeling things. Yeah. I have the superpower of being able to choose how I use that energy and what I decide to feel. And then if you want to be hyper successful as a person, you have to be very careful to avoid the happy hole because happy is what everyone thinks they would choose. If you had this emotional energy and could choose any emotion, you'd choose happy. But if you choose happy, you don't get much done. What do you choose? I choose, if I had to choose how I wanted to feel all the time, I would choose proud. And proud means you have to work. Proud means you have to do things, you right. have to achieve things. Right. If you want to be proud and be realistic, you have to do fantastic things. So my default favorite emotion is proud. Right. That's how I, I'm happiest when I feel proud about anything. I, I love proud feel good. You to feel good. Feel good. Yeah. I don't like happy. If I feel happy, giddish happiness, like a child or like a females usually default to happy. They don't care how they get there. They just want to get there. Right. They just want to feel happy. Right. I avoid the happy hole because I think people who are desperate to only feel happy are the ones who are addicts, you know, gambling addicts, yeah. drug addicts, drink too much, yeah. do dumb shit. It's all temporary, no delayed gratification. That's how you destroy your life choosing the happy hole. Mm -hmm. So we were talking earlier about jail and how when I felt particularly bad, I'd wake up with a whole bunch of emotional energy. It's unchanneled. It's a bit wild. So I guess that can be perceived as sad yeah, you're out of or depressed. Routine. You're out of your routine. So I would sit and go, okay, I have all this emotional energy today. Where am I going to put it? And I'd put it in a place where perhaps on that day I might feel happy or perhaps I'd choose something else, but I would try my very best to take all the energy and put it into a place where the feeling that emotion was the most competitive emotion or it was the perfect emotion for me to be as competitive as possible in that particular scenario. So yeah, on days where I woke up and I felt a little bit sad, I'd be like, okay, I, I'm gonna turn the charm on today. I'm gonna make everybody laugh. Right. And by the end of the day, I felt fantastic. When it felt completely terrible, I do have the emotional control to not feel that, but I decided to let myself feel it because I felt like I wouldn't learn as much That's if right. I turned my brain off. That's right. So we, I've talked on PBD about Tristan. Tristan and I have the same superpower. Tristan didn't care about jail. He didn't care. He didn't, or he, maybe, he, he acted like he didn't care. He acted like he didn't yeah. care, but that's, it was his coping mechanism. Sure. Don't care about jail. I decided, no, I'm going to care. I'm going to feel everything. I'm going to allow myself to feel these negative emotions because I feel like I will learn more. I could have done what Tristan did. I could have woke up and said one day or later, they'll let me out. I'm still rich. Give a fuck. Right. Could have done that. I didn't do that. And jail, that's why he sleeps. That's why I have nightmares because I don't believe his jail experience was that traumatic because he, he was very, he turned his brain off to it. Really? And, and that is a superpower. Yes. And, and I do have that power. If I went to war, I could go to war and watch all my friends be blown to pieces and still fight. I would still be capable. I can turn my brain off if I have to, but I decided not to because I felt that feeling things would teach me more, which is why I'm 
kind of arguing your point about death and rebirth because I feel like I don't have to fully break. I just have to get close enough to the edge to learn something and come back. Does God want me to break? I don't know. You asked. You asked the question. <laughs> and if he does, I will break. Right. Right? Well, but I won't have a choice. I won't have a choice. But but jail itself was was terrible. Like we're talking about vulnerability. I can sit and explain all the things I struggle with in jail. It was absolutely terrible. And I think a lot of people who are watching this, I think they need to keep in mind I wasn't in jail. I was in Romania in jail. Which is what's the difference? Well, it's the poorest country in Europe and it's built during communism right. and it's basically designed to torture. Yeah. yeah. I mean it's it's not like jail, like we imagine jail. I don't want to insult the Romanian justice system. I don't want to insult any Romanians. I'm still within the confines of Romania, but I think most people at home understand what I'm talking about. I didn't have yard time. I didn't have any friends. I was in a room for 93 days. I did not leave that room unless I was being dragged to court in a language I didn't understand to be sent back to the room. Yeah, it was hard. And uh, you don't sleep very well. People think you just sleep it off, but you can't. The jail is very loud. There's a lot of distressed people in there, a lot of upset people. The energy is sad. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a bad place to be. But I knew that my only option was to deal with it. So I knew that not handling it wasn't an option. So if not handling it, it's not an option. The only option left is handling it. So you just have to find the best way to do it. And I certainly allowed myself to feel a lot of emotions in there that I could have probably black, blocked out so that I could learn as many lessons as possible. And I've learned a lot of things. But I would say that I mean, all in all, I understood as a man, you need to have a strong body so you're not attacked by anyone else and a strong mind so you don't attack yourself. And I think jail in many ways is just pressurized life. And if you feel a little bit angry outside of jail, you'll be very angry in jail. It's pressurized life and you can't distract yourself with anything. Most people, if you feel angry right now, you'd be like, oh, that pissed me off. And then you got your phone and you talk to someone else about something else, you distract yourself. But you're left alone with your thoughts and you can't distract yourself. And uh, God decided to put me in there to learn some things. And I think it just confirmed a bunch of things I already knew. And I think it was a chance for me to prove to him and to prove to myself I'm not full of shit. And I think that that was... Did you worry that you were full of shit? Never. But it's good when you get to test it. <laughs> no, but this is actually the truth. I, 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 top G, right? It's a name, it's a nickname, blah, blah, blah. Top G. The, the basic premise behind it and why I'm idolized by all these young men, especially is I'm top G, the number one G, the, the guy who can do anything. He's the guy. I never for a second when I was saying it didn't mean it. I never for a second when I was saying it thought I was full of shit. So God was like, okay, let's find out he's full of shit. And I was placed there and I said, all right, this is a chance for me to prove to myself and prove to God and prove to the man watching on the, to the prison guards and prove to everyone else, my ancestors, that I'm not full of shit. I had a sense of duty in there and I feel like I performed it exceptionally. And it doesn't matter if they kept me in there for three months or three years or 30 years. I have to perform. That's who I am and I will default to rationalizing, as you said, <laughs> whatever it takes, I will come up with any rationale yeah. and I will say it in any way which is interesting and engaging and convincing enough to the outside world and to myself to install it in my brain that allows me to compete. That's just what I'm going to do because yeah. I don't want to lose anything ever. Yeah. And yeah, I, life, perhaps if we want to extrapolate this out, perhaps God's trying to break all of us. Maybe life is a big competition of who breaks last. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I would actually argue, I would argue, <laughs> yeah. and I said this before, that the number one indicator of a man's success is his ability to deal with stress. I don't think it's IQ, I don't think it's physical capability, I don't think it's anything. If you take a man who can deal with a bunch of stress, he's going to be more successful than a man who can deal with less stress. How much stress you can put up with has a direct correlation to the kind of life you're going to live. Most people who want my life don't have my life because they couldn't handle my life. Yeah. That's why. They go, I want to be like Tate, I want fast cars and private jets and all these girls and all these kids and all the blah, blah, blah. But they couldn't handle it. They couldn't deal with the pressure of it, which is why they'll never get there. Because even if they get anywhere near it, they'll have a mental breakdown. Right, right. So how, how big your life is and how successful you are in the physical realm is directly linked to how much stress you can deal with. And perhaps God's trying to break all of us and he's trying to find all of our limits. Yeah. I think most people at home watching this probably have something going on in their mind right now or something going on in their lives that might break them. Yeah. To me, it would be nothing. To them, it's a big deal. Yeah. So. God's out here to break all of us and I want to be the guy who breaks last. You have two responses to that. You can either be intimidated by the fact that God is out there trying to make your life difficult or you can be excited by the idea of it and saying, this is my chance to prove myself to God. Right. Which is what I was saying earlier on in the very beginning of our podcast, why I've adopted the mindset where struggle is semi-exciting to me. Yeah. God is out here trying to 
ask me questions or put me through scenarios where I get to prove myself to him and perhaps that's why all the bad things happen. Maybe that's why that girl left you. Maybe that's why he made you love her so much so that she could break your heart and fuck your best friend on purpose so that you, to see how close you could come to breaking. Maybe that's what it's all about. Maybe that's the fun of it. I do believe that the moral arc of the universe does bend towards truth. That's not my saying. I think that's Martin Luther King's. But I think that it bends towards truth and justice in the end. I think that the battles we are currently fighting in society, which look hopeless, in the end can, can be won. And I feel like I am doing his will by standing up and telling the truth. I think I'd have to be a complete coward of a man to end up having all of the masculine youth of a planet paying attention to every word I say, and then say, oh, but if I tell them good things, if I help them and help the world by extension, I might get in trouble. That'd make me a bitch, and that's not who I am. Yeah. So if, I think if you give any man worth his salt that degree of power and influence and responsibility, he's gonna stand up and say, okay, this is how you should live as a man, and this is how you can make the world a better place. Unless he's afraid of the repercussions by the evil people, by the people who are on the other side who are genuinely evil and satanic who are out to destroy good and truth. And I'm not a coward. I've never seen myself as a coward. And in fact, we don't talk about vulnerability. The number one thing I could never exist as is a coward. I think that's, you won't talk about my biggest fear. It would be knowing I'm a coward. Seeing myself as a coward and being very realistic and knowing I was actually a coward. I couldn't, I couldn't accept that because I feel like I would be disappointing all of my ancestors and God. And I would have been full of shit all the time I was talking. Now I'm a fake. Now I'm a liar. And I'm none of those things. Right. When I say to the camera and I sit here and talk about depression not being real, I mean what I say because I've lived enough shit to tell you that if depression was real, I would have been depressed. Mm -hmm. And people know that, which is why they listen to me in the first place. Mm -hmm. I would hate to be, to look in the mirror and know I acted like a coward on that scenario. I, I can't be that person. Right. Well, I like to think of myself as a man with plenty of love in his life and a very loving man. I also like to think of myself as an extremely brave person. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've never been a coward. And even just the idea of being a coward is enough to motivate me to do nearly anything. Mm -hmm. So if you were to try and, here we go, vulnerability. <laughs> if you were to try and manipulate me, how could you manipulate Andrew Tate, one of the smartest people on the face of the planet? Well, you would have to try and convince him that it was the only brave act. Mm -hmm. That's how I could be manipulated. Interesting. Now, I allow manipulation to find out where my enemy wants me to go, use my mind to break the trap, punish the perpetrators. I will allow them to manipulate me, and at the end of their attempt, I will decide whether I agree with their attempt or I destroy their attempt. Right. But that would be give you the best possible chance. Mm -hmm. And i give you a perfect example of it. COVID, when on day one, when everyone got locked in their houses and they were talking about Italian hospitals being full and people were dying on the street in China, when everyone believed because it was brand new, day one, me and Tristan decided to fly to Sweden and just run around in nightclubs because it's the only open country. Mm -hmm. Did we do that because we have medical expertise? Did we do that because we were guaranteed to not get sick? Did we do that because we knew something other people didn't know? It was the brave choice. Mm -hmm. The brave choice is to go do something reckless. We might all die. Let's die in a nightclub in Sweden instead of dying in our house. So we always have chosen and defaulted to the brave choice. And part of me, maybe when we talk about excitement, I love when God or life or the universe or whatever you want to call it, gives me a chance to be brave. I love when he gives me an opportunity. Here's your chance to be brave, Andrew. Here is your chance to show you are that guy. Here's your chance to have another story where everyone else would have failed, you would have succeeded. Here is your chance to win. I love that because, you know, it's easy to fly around on private jets and stay in five star hotels with a bunch of beautiful women and drive the daddies around, cool. But where's the point where I get to actually prove I'm, I mean every word I say? Right. So God gave it to me. So yes, thank you. I agree, <laughs> we agree. Thank you. And if God decides I have to go back, then the best mental model I can have is not, the Romanian system of justice is unfair, uh, it's corrupt, I got too big, the matrix got me. No, the best mental model is God wants me to learn something here. And he's gonna teach me that through suffering. He's gonna make this difficult and he's gonna make me feel pain and he's gonna make this as hard as he decides it needs to be so that I can sit here and learn things. So I'm gonna go and sit with my cockroach friends and I'm gonna learn. I, I learned, I've never had nightmares before in my life. That surprised me. That surprised me. But they're here now, that's life. I learned that, I guess. I learned that when I got out of jail. I didn't have nightmares in jail, which is strange. I had nightmares when I got out. Maybe it's fear of going back. But 
what else did I learn about myself? I had already pre-decided and I'd already told the universe how I would act in said scenario. This scenario was not a scenario I hadn't discussed or didn't believe could happen to me. I had already analyzed, if this happens, what are you gonna do? It was a pre-designated plan. And I just followed the plan I had already laid out for myself when I had already psychoanalyzed myself without my qualifications. I had already decided what I must do, so I did it. And, and, I, was, and, I, and I was able and capable of following the plan and following through. So I'm not a liar, I'm 0% full of shit. I performed exactly how I needed to perform and how I knew I would perform. So when I talk about being top G and mental control and depression is not real, everything I say is true. I performed exactly as I could and I should. There is a side effect which happens to be these nightmares, but my attitude towards the nightmares is yes, thank you. Good, I don't want them to go away. They will go away when whatever needs to be dealt with is dealt with by my own mind. And like I said, if anyone right. else could fix them for me, I would not allow them to because I believe it is my lesson and it's my pain and my trauma and it's mine to deal with. And if I have to keep them forever, I'll keep them. Mm -hmm. I am not afraid of feeling negative. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of having nightmares. I'm not, I, don't, I don't wake up going, I want to feel good. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So if I have to feel miserable, it doesn't bother me. For me to sit and say to the man who made me the man I am today, yeah. who I, once again, never felt unloved by, who tried his very best to raise me, who sacrificed for me to exist, who gave me my last name, who bestowed upon me the honors and principles and morals I live by today, yeah. for me to be angry at him because he was busy some days would be brutally ungrateful. No, it's I'm not feeling. allowed. No, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed that feeling. It's ungrateful. I refuse to accept it. I refuse to feel it. I truly believe I had the best father on earth. I truly believe it. I don't believe, even now, if, if I have sons, I don't talk about what children I have publicly, if I have sons or when I have sons or my sons I have, whichever one it is, they will get my time, sure. They will get my dedication, absolutely. But I have expectations of them because of their last name. And they're gonna have my time while we're working towards something fantastic. I'm not gonna just sit around with my kids just for hours because they just deserve it. There's no participation trophies in the Tate household. Right. And time is, and time is a trophy and it must be earned, like everything else in life. So I'm not gonna sit and have sons and go, well, he's my son, so we're just gonna all day do fucking nothing. No, we're gonna all day do something important, or I'm gonna go do something important. And he can sit around and do nothing by himself. Well, as a man, you have to make a choice, and I think it used to be more binary than it is today because of the nature of money and empire and how things work, but as a man, you have to make a choice. You either go to war and come back with stories, or you sit at home all day and be a second mother, and, and then you're not a man. It's, you have to find the balance between the two, right? Yeah. My father was away a lot, but he wasn't away a lot because he was doing nothing, right? So if you have a soldier as a, as a father, okay, he's not there, but he's doing something. He's coming back with a story. And I think that that was typical in a lot of households for a very long time. Maybe it's changed a little bit in modern times, but typically the man went away, yeah. did whatever he had to do, and then came back with a story or a hunt or whatever. Yeah, sure. So that's how I saw my father living his life. And that's how I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. I will do the same thing. I don't think I would, be the same man if I decided to say, okay, I have a son now, so I'm just gonna stay at home. And I think that I need to be a kind of man my son wants to emulate, which means I have to be a hero, and I don't think you can be a hero sitting at home. So I think that I need to, yeah, he needs time, of course he does, but he also needs an example set, and that example must be set out there in the harsh, brutal realities of the real world. So, yeah, it's you time, You could, now the argument is quantity of time versus quality of time. And I would argue that the quality of time I will give my sons is gonna be much higher. Are you a man of love? I think a lot of those things come from love. Hmm. Let's, let's analyze this. I think a lot of those things come from love. I think it's very difficult to do nearly anything important if it's not perhaps to a degree driven by love or the desire for love. I think the reason a lot of men want to become rich is because they want to feel loved or feel important or to matter. I also feel like the reason that a lot of men do the things they do is, is for love either of themselves or of someone else. I think the reason men go to work is because they love their family. The reason you go to the gym is because you love yourself. I think that love is a very powerful driving force. I certainly feel love. My world is full of love. Like, I would argue I'm one of the most loved people on the planet. Like, if I check my phone, mm -hmm. it's just love. Yeah. It's endless emails of people I don't know who love me, endless females who do know me love me, endless pictures of children saying they miss me. Like, my, my, I'm a very loved person in yes. a very loved yes. world. 
I love a lot of people. You love. I absolutely love, but because I believe in myself so strongly, mm -hmm. I feel like the way I love them is to have a degree of authority over them. Not in a crazy psychopathic way, but in a, I love you, so you should do this. Right. I love you, so act this way. I love you, so do, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Almost in the same way a parent loves a child. You love your child, so you don't let them eat candy all day. Because yeah. you love them. Yeah. I'm like that with everyone in my life. Mm -hmm. Because I see myself as the most competent person on the planet. So I'm like, I love you, I care about you. You shouldn't do this this way. Right. Because you may think you know better, but you're, you don't. You don't know better yeah. than me. I know best, and this is how it should be mm -hmm. for anyone I care about. And it's the most powerful driving force on the face of the planet. It always has been. Mm -hmm. And it's only when people are gonna wake up and have a true love for themselves and love for the community and love for their children and love for these things that we're gonna start to resist the evil and the Satanism and the insanity which is coming in the world today. But I believe, as a man at least, your love only has value when you're capable. Which is why my mayor, perhaps I'm so obsessed with capability because I want my love to have value. We talked about how time has value when you're at a certain echelon. I would also argue that love has value when you're at a certain echelon. If I'm in love with a girl, she can get a lot more from that love than if a Joe Schmo's in love with her, right? So my love has value because I have value. So I have to build myself. And especially as a man, if you want to feel love, then you want to give love, the more capable you become, the more valuable your love is going to be. And yeah. that's, that's certainly yeah. how we're going to fix right. the world. So yeah, the answer is love, of course, but it can't just be blind, empty love. It has to be love that is backed by a brutal, harsh capability, right. which is born in the, the worst scenarios you're going to endure as a man. And the world at its baseline is a very brutal place. It can be. And I think that Becoming comfortable with those scenarios and becoming capable in those scenarios is how you give your love deep, true value. But I think that, yeah, love is the answer. Right, love is the answer. A father's love comes with tests and trials and tribulations. What does a dad even traditionally do for his son? Take him out there, push him in the pool, let him struggle a bit, get him out. Yeah. Put him on the bike, let him fall over, yeah. help him get up. Yeah. yeah, you have to go through the bad things to be rewarded and the bad things to learn. That's how a father typically loves. Yeah. And a father also loves by saying no. Right. No, you cannot do that. So you nailed it by how society needs a father's love, completely true. And society has actually hijacked the word love and tried to convince you that you don't need the father's love. Perhaps you need this unconditional love, which is more like a mother's love. If you want to gender it, perhaps. Yeah. So it's unconditional. You can act without honor. You can act without courage. You can act without discipline and you'll be loved anyway, just because you exist. I don't believe that for myself. I believe if I start, if I remove all my morality, I will not just be loved by default. Not by my family, not by God, not by society. I don't believe that. And the people who do believe that, who think I should be loved just for how I, just for existing, regardless of how I act and what I think, those are some of the most evil people on the planet. I truly believe. And they're also some of the most unsuccessful and unspectacular. And they're the people who are out here genuinely trying to change society in a direction which has never been tested, which I believe is going to lead down to the, to the depths of hell, truly. I think it's evil. So yeah, I agree with you. Father's love is important, but love in and of itself has banned boundaries love yes, is strict love is hard yes, love is yes. love is a hard emotion fierce. love is fierce love is not an emotion of oh I'll do whatever you want it's the opposite love is no you have to do this mm -hmm. i believe love is a very hard very strong emotion mm -hmm. and if i think of how let's say i have two women one i love one i don't love and i enjoy both of their company i'm harder on the one i love mm -hmm. i expect more from her in terms of how she acts i expect more from her in terms of how she speaks to me mm -hmm. I expect more from her and how she presents herself to the world. The more I love her, the more I expect of her, the more parameters I want to put on her in regards to how she should behave. Because I love her. Mm -hmm. love, it, love is a hard emotion. So yeah, love wins, but not in the way that people think love. They've hijacked the word love and convinced people that love means, oh, I tolerate everything. Right. That's, in, that's not love. Even in jail that happened. Even in jail, I had moments of presence and I looked around and goes, this is not nearly as bad mm. as at, like the media is saying it is and the woman on the phone are crying and everyone's panicking. You know what? I'm not in a trench. I'm probably not going to get blown up. If a fire started, could I get through that steel door? If anyone could, it's me. <laughs> I'm not on a submarine in World War II. There's no depth charges. Yeah. I'm not in a car crash. Yeah. It's fine. Cup of tea. I did have those moments, right? So when you come to a moment, 
Yeah, when you come to a moment of presence, even in a terrible scenario, it often ends up love. Yeah. You're right. And I certainly have felt them and I certainly could do it. My rationale would be, my argument would be, does that make me more powerful? You're arguing it does and maybe perhaps I need to try it. Whereas I would typically up until this conversation, I would say, I don't have time for that. I have things to do. So that's where it all comes down to. And then it comes down to, like I said earlier, am I here as a human to enjoy my experience as a human and enjoy being in this vessel and have as much fun as possible and be as present as possible? Or am I here to make the biggest impact I can possibly make and, and build a legacy? And of course, probably like most things in life, the answer is somewhere in between the two is probably some balance. Yeah. Perhaps I'm slightly out of balance and that's why I am living the life I am. But I'm not unhappy with it. And if I was unhappy with it, it wouldn't change anything. But I, I actually do consider myself, I do genuinely consider myself one of, one of, because I put no importance on emotion. And when I say that, I try and make people understand that when I say no importance, it doesn't affect how I act. So I don't see the point in talking about it or I don't see the point in even acknowledging it yeah. because it doesn't affect what I'm going to do for the day. So who cares, right? It doesn't matter if it's sunny or rainy. If you're going to go to work, you're going to go to work. So why talk about the weather? So I don't put any importance on emotion, but I would actually call myself one of the happiest people on earth. Not because I'm particularly happy, but because I'm just never sad. Mm. So if, you're, if it's never dark, it must be light. If it's never cold, it must be hot. So I'm, I don't, I, when I say, I will say I'm one of the happiest people on earth and people think, oh, he's happy all the time. No, I'm just never sad, never. So if you're never sad, you're always happy. When we were talking about how I built my mental model and how I rationalize everything, one of the things I've done when I rationalize is I've changed the boundary of what I believe happy to be. So let's say happiness is this line on this table, right? Yeah. Most people, this is the full spectrum of human emotion. This is absolute distraught because your parents just died. And this is extremely happy and giddish and you're laughing and jumping around like a child for whatever reason. Most people would probably put happy somewhere up here near the top. Yeah. Whereas I've just changed that bar. And I've just said, unless I'm truly distraught, unless I'm actually at the point where I can barely speak, let's move happiness down to here. Unless I'm truly distraught and something right. really bad has right. happened to me, I've already passed the threshold. And I'm yeah. just a different level of happy. Yeah. Now, I'm, I, the more I talk to you, the more I realize that a lot of what I've done are just simply semantic tricks. Mm -hmm. tricks. Yeah. They're language tricks. Yeah. I've changed language tricks. If I'm not absolutely distraught, I am some version of happy, mm -hmm. therefore I'm the happiest man on earth because I'm always some level of happy. Yeah. It's semantic tricks, but if it works, I mean, it could be a cheap language trick, but if the cheap language trick works, mm -hmm. then it's more than a cheap language trick. Yeah. So, I've also changed what I believe happy to be. I think that there's probably five or six times in your adult life you're gonna be unhappy, and the rest of the time you're just a different level of happy. Mm -hmm. Maybe less happy, mm -hmm. more happy, but you're all at some point of happy. If you can speak, you're happy enough, because when you're truly upset, you can't even talk. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe.